Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Uh, please note that we have live captioning and ASL translation uh, available today, and that the recording of today's session will be posted online uh, later today. Uh, we'll, we'll be going until about 2 p.m. Uh, I'm joined as usual by Provost Collins, Vice President for Student Life Harmon, and our Chief Health Officer, uh, Dr. Milani. Uh, but also today we have with us Dean of the School of Public Health, uh, uh, Du Bois Bowman, uh, Dean of the School of Engineering, Alec Gallimore, and Associate Professor of Epidemiology, uh, Emily Martin. Uh, we've got a lot to cover today and we'll get to questions if we can, but as always, we'll post answers to questions that we don't get to on my website later. Earlier today, as I'm sure most of you know, we announced our plan for the winter semester on the Ann Arbor campus. But first, let me provide a little bit of context. The spread of COVID-19 is higher now than at any time during the pandemic. And that spread is in Michigan, as well as most every other state. There were over 121,000 cases, new cases in the United States reported on Wednesday of this week. That's a record. Michigan had 5,710 new cases on Wednesday. Spread is occurring amongst all age groups, not just mainly young people, but now it's spread across the population once again. Hospitals are filling again with COVID-19 patients, placing a strain on overall healthcare in our country. And although our classrooms and campus facilities were safe this semester, our experience resulted in an unacceptable level of spread amongst our undergraduate students on campus and off uh, that got to a level that threatened our public health capacity to control that spread. We have over 1,500 COVID-19 infections among students this semester, with more than 500 of those being in our residence halls. Also, we did not get uniform cooperation with case investigation, isolation, and quarantine. Some students would not speak with case investigators and others were found to be holding parties while in quarantine. This is simply not acceptable. We're heading into winter, the usual peak season for virus spread and for other diseases as well, like influenza, and they'll combine to place further stress on our healthcare system. So the plans we announced today reflects a tremendous amount of feedback uh, we've gotten from the community and engagement from the broader community and reflect the following conclusions. There are many different views on what an ideal semester should look like at U of M during the pandemic. That's not a surprise given the diversity of our campus. Our plans seek to help faculty and students advance their academic goals and make sure that our students can make progress towards their degrees uh, with new measures to address key concerns. Safety remains an utmost concern throughout our community. Testing for the virus that causes COVID-19 is an important tool that we need to deploy more aggressively and make easier to access, requiring it for some. The engagement we've conducted includes multiple meetings with students and faculty and staff uh, representing various groups. Uh, Vice President Harmon and I have met with RAs, dining hall employees. We visited with students in line in the dining halls. I've spoken with the uh, environmental health uh, team that's doing all of the case investigation and contact tracing. I got to attend a hybrid class. Uh, thanks, Elise Portnoy uh, in LSA. Uh, I had a fireside chat for students. I've met multiple times with SACUA, CSG leaders, various labor leaders, and many concerned faculty and staff. Uh, we've met, of course, many times with the regents and had ongoing discussions with the Washtenaw County Health Department. We've learned a lot about the concerns of the community uh, from these weekly briefings and I appreciate your candor and engagement uh, in all different modalities. Uh, it's cold and flu season, colder weather and COVID fatigue are very real challenges for us in this coming semester. That's why we've revamped our testing regimen. We will further reduce campus density and provide more options for remote learning. This will make it easier to comply with public health guidelines and ease pressure on our quarantine and isolation housing and contact tracing. Uh, to briefly summarize the key elements of the plan for the winter semester, uh, only courses that must be taught in person will be done so as determined by instructors and program leaders. No instructors will be required to teach in person if they choose not to. Our plans emphasize the academic mission. 
We seek to ensure that all of our students and faculty can continue to advance their academic goals in as many ways as possible, and that students continue to progress to complete their Michigan degrees. We will require entry COVID-19 testing for key groups in our community, including those living in residence halls and those who teach in person. We'll require weekly testing for undergraduate resident hall students and undergraduate students participating in on-campus activities. Further, we'll make testing available weekly for any students, as well as for faculty and staff who come to campus. To reduce density in our residence halls, undergraduate students who don't need to live in residence halls should remain at their permanent residences for the semester. We'll continue to provide a safe place for a smaller number of students in our residence halls, particularly those students for whom U of M is their home or who need to be on campus for health or safety reasons, to complete required in-person coursework or other extraordinary extenuating circumstances. There'll only be one student to a room. If their academic commitments allow them to do so, we also encourage students to live off campus to study remotely from their permanent homes during the winter semester. At today's briefing, we'll discuss this plan in greater detail and share some of the engagement at work that led to these decisions. Uh, Dean Bowman will discuss public health considerations that he and his colleagues developed that were part of the planning. Uh, Dean Gallimore will discuss the findings of the student, faculty, and staff surveys we conducted. Provost Collins will discuss the winter term instructional plan in a bit more detail. Vice President for Student Life, Martino Harmon, will discuss housing, dining, and enforcement of our various uh, rules during the winter term. Associate Professor of Epidemiology, Emily Martin, will discuss our winter testing regimen. And finally, Chief Health Officer, Dr. Preeti Malani, will discuss important mental health and well being efforts to take place during the semester. So now I'd first like to introduce Dean Bowman to discuss public health considerations. Thank you, President Schlissel. So I plan to walk through a set of slides that speak largely to some of the introductory comments that we just heard from uh, President Schlissel. And the, the first point I think to keep in mind is that we are uh, experiencing a novel coronavirus. So as we enter the winter months less than one year uh, after dealing with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 in the United States, we are in uncharted territory. And we don't anticipate that a vaccine or wholly effective therapeutic treatment will be uh, widely available to the general public in time to greatly influence uh, the winter semester. So we need to plan with the understanding that the virus will continue to be present. Uh, next slide, please. In, in public health, we uh, considered a lot of uh, factors and data sources as we try to anticipate what the winter may bring. Uh, listed here are some of those, you know, the, the global, national, and local epidemiologic trends, just to try to get a sense of the, the state of the, the pandemic, what we know about other coronaviruses, lessons learned from the, the fall semester on campus at the university, models to project various future scenarios, and then, and then best practices for a range of things like testing, reducing spread, and improving outcomes. Some of these things I'll talk about uh, over the next few minutes, some, some will be uh, covered by uh, my, my colleague, Dr. Emily Martin. Next slide. So overall in the, in the state, uh, some of you may have heard Governor Whitmer in a recent press conference, we are experiencing unprecedented levels, so record case, case counts in the state of Michigan. And in fact, these increases are in every region across the state and also in every age group. And likewise, many states across the country are also experiencing uh, spikes in case counts. Next slide. So not surprisingly, as the number of case counts dramatically rises, then the statewide hospitalization trends shown here uh, follow. And so since late September, we've been on a really, really, really steep increase 
in terms of the, the number of hospitalizations, which poses to, uh, to str strain our healthcare capacity. And fortunately, Michigan Medicine locally is a, a premier hospital system and it has been able to handle local cases, uh, but we must remain mindful of the potential strain on, on uh, the healthcare capacity. Next slide. Similarly, as cases increase, hospitalization increase, the number of deaths from uh, COVID-19 uh, will likely increase. This shows uh, patterns from modeling on a national level uh, back since March. Uh, through, and, and as it goes from red to the dashed line, we see what may be forthcoming later in the month of November and, and into the winter months, uh, December, January, and February. And, and also covered in Governor Whitmer's uh, recent press conference, she indicated that even here in the state of Michigan, that into December, if things continue, we we may experience 100 deaths per day here in the in the state of Michigan. Uh, next slide. So as mentioned, this is a, a novel uh, coronavirus. And so sometimes we look to other uh, coronaviruses or respiratory viruses to get a sense of what, what may be forthcoming. This shows data from other related coronaviruses. So not SARS-CoV-2 and, it and it's a two year cycle. The X axis is, is uh, uh, hard to read, but the, the main point is very simple. And I think it jumps out at you. The beginning of uh, the peaks uh, start around late October and November, and we see high high positivity counts, and that basically remains and doesn't subside until the end of March or April. The second peak of the of the following year uh, centered around the same time period. So as we move into the winter months, we are uh, similarly anticipating uh, continued uh, increases in, in in cases of of COVID nineteen. Next slide. So, so thinking about other challenges that are unique to winter, uh, you know, with nationwide outbreaks uh, and outbreaks as indicated in every region of the of the state of Michigan, we'll have students returning from high risk areas uh, as they as they return to campus. Also, the change in weather. We've been fortunate enough, and today is a perfect example to have great weather so far this fall that allows for a range of outdoor activities. Uh, with a change in weather, uh, there's a possibility that this stands to increase or intensify indoor spread. And then lastly, I'll, I'll comment that, that we are uh, approaching flu season and uh, flu season stands to also increase the strain on public health and, and healthcare capacity and also adds risk of co-infection or sequential infection. Next slide. So in terms of experiences on the University of Michigan campus, uh, the, the, the graph shown here shows the uh, case counts over time and it's across two age groups. Barely down at the bottom, barely visible is a greenish line. It's, it's for the age group uh, above 22 years of age where there's very you know, small and, and, and stable amount of activity over the, the course of the semester thus far. Uh, in the reddish trend, what we see is, you know, varying but much higher activity, uh, which points to the fact that there has been just, just markedly more activity in younger members of the University of Michigan campus. Next slide. Additionally, from data gathered largely through contact tracing, uh, most outbreaks have been traced to social gatherings. Uh, most, many of which did not follow some of the basic public health recommendations. So things like uh, limits on size of gathering, use of masks and social distancing certainly uh, contributed to, to spread. Also high density living arrangements led to accelerated spread and challenges on uh, to the public health infrastructure as we have higher density, greater number of contacts per case. Uh, that, that correspondingly has an impact on things like uh, quarantine and isolation space. Uh, so there's a need to ensure adequate testing also, uh, but also other, other aspects of public health capacity. Next slide. So to, to conclude, I'll show just a couple of, uh, of, of figures as we also 
um, uh, consider models as we think about various scenarios and various factors and try to determine how adjustments to those factors might impact uh, our experience on campus. This one shows residence hall occupancy ranging from zero uh, to 100 uh, percent occupancy. And then what's what's plotted are the uh, corresponding number of cases per week uh, for at, at the University of Michigan. And so as one would expect, as we increase the residence hall occupancy, we uh, correspondingly an anticipate a rise in, in, in case counts on campus. Uh, next slide. And uh, this similarly shows and reinforces the point of being uh, poised with uh, public health capacity uh, to, in any case, whether we're experiencing surges or not, to be able to respond quickly. So it shows days of from onset to isolation, again, ranging from zero to five. If we get to a point where there's a backlog in cases and those cases aren't able to be uh, investigated and traced, that in, in, in a timely fashion, that that too leads to increased uh, spread among University of Michigan. Uh, campus community. And so this was something that we confronted later in the semester and made adjustments to make sure that we had capacity uh, to follow up on cases in a timely fashion. So I'll conclude there, but but I, I think a, a one take home message is that what we will confront in the winter months in terms of the pandemic uh, are, could be markedly worse than what we've confronted uh, moving into the fall semester and correspondingly the university has to consider those uh, factors in our plans. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Dean Bowman. I now call upon uh, Dean Gallimore to talk about some of our survey results. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm representing the uh, Winter 2021 Campus Coordinating Committee and presenting the survey results and a few of our recommendations. Our committee was charged to review lessons learned from the fall 2020 semester gather input from the campus community to inform winter 2021 decisions and make recommendations to support decision-making regarding winter 2021. We have representations from the academic units, student life and the provost office. Also contributing to the report are uh, student life's office of student life assessment and research and also SACUA. Our sources of input include student input, which includes a survey sent to all learners enrolled in the Ann Arbor campus and focus group discussions conducted in select Ann Arbor residence hall by student life. We also received input from the COVID-19 faculty council, an instructor survey sent to all tenure track faculty, clinical track faculty, lecturers and GSIs on the Ann Arbor campus, a staff pulse survey sent to student affairs, student life staff, budget administrators and chief human resource officers in academic units on the Ann Arbor campus, input from the public health steering committee, and finally, input from deans and directors on the Ann Arbor campus. Today, I will focus on the survey results and provide some of our report recommendations. First, the student survey highlights. We surveyed undergraduates, graduate students, and professional students. The purpose of the survey was to learn about the experience of UM Ann Arbor students during the fall 2020 semester and their expectations for winter 21 semester. The survey was administered between October 16 and October 20 and was prepared by the coordinating committee and Student Life's Office of Student Life Assessment and Research. We received 9,000 responses across all degree levels out of 48,000 surveys sent out, so a 19% response rate. The response rate for each degree level range from 17.5% to 21%. Note the survey was completed prior to the stay in place order of the Washington County Public Health Department. Now to the results. First, for the fall 2020 recap, 83% of undergraduates report that in-person learning experience is better than remote. 75% of our undergraduates and master's students noted that the workload is too high or higher than expected and less than 17% of the undergraduates participate in any in-person academic experience. The majority of the students chose remote instruction even when in-person options were available for the primary reason of concern over their own health, the health of their peers, and the health of the instructors. 
When asked whether they feel valued as an individual at the University of Michigan, 60% of undergraduates reported not at all or a little, while only 8% reported very. Now focusing on winter 2021, access to libraries and in-person study spaces was listed as the top concern of undergraduates. If there are no changes between how things were in the fall and what they're likely to be in the winter, at least 85% of each degree level will remain enrolled. About 11% are unsure and a 4% will not enroll. However, if we go fully remote, about 75% say they will remain enrolled. 8% will not enroll and 17% are unsure. Finally, about 21% of our undergraduates are either unsure whether they will stay in the dorms or plan to leave university housing. Now to the survey highlights for the instructors. A survey of similar purpose was sent to our GSIs, lecturers, tenure track faculty members, and clinical track faculty members on the Ann Arbor campus. The survey was administered between October 19 and October 22 and was prepared by the coordinating committee, the office of the provost, and SACU. The survey was sent to 9,000 instructors, some 3,000 GSIs, 1,500 lecturers, 3,200 tenure track faculty members, and 2,200 clinical track faculty members. We received about 2,200 responses out of 9,900 with a 22% response rate. And the response rate ranged from around 7.3% for clinical faculty members and 33% for lecturers. Of those who responded, 44% were from LSNA and 11% were from the College of Engineering. For the fall 2020 recap, the vast majority of those responded were teaching in some sort of virtual format. Instructor concerns over safety, namely virus transmission, drove modality decisions. Some 83% of respondents indicated that their courses, however, were going as expected or better than expected. GSIs were most likely to respond that classes were going below expectations at about 11.5% compared to 8.2% for tenure track faculty members and 5.6% for lecturers. Now shifting to winter 2021, 68% preferred virtual teaching modality modes for winter 2021 semester for the following reasons cited. 71% cited concerns over safety as a primary reason. About a quarter, 25% concerns over student behavior and a 23% lack of trust in the current public health protocols. And finally, shifting to the staff survey, our committee wanted to collect input from some of the staff who are most directly engaged in student facing work closely related to the student academic experience. The brief pulse survey was distributed to some 506 staff in the groups noted earlier. Our committee acknowledges the limited sampling of the survey and that the results reported here may not be representative of how student facing staff as a whole feel. Now to the results. I will focus on the responses received from the Student Affairs Network and Student Life staff. For fall 2020, 50% are working um, either on campus or working from home. 38% are working fully remote. 63% somewhat or strongly express, express confidence in the strategic direction of the university. Shifting to winter 21, 55% of student affairs respondents strongly or somewhat agree that the winter 2021 semester should stay the same as how fall 2020 started. When asked about areas of greatest concern if winter 2021 follows the same approach as fall 2020, the top five answers were student health and well being, colleagues' health and well being, employee morale, employees' own health and well being, and university financial impacts. When asked about areas of concern if winter 2021 is fully remote, the top five answers were university financial impacts, student co-curricular experience, student academic experience, student success, and employee morale. I don't have time to go through the 11 recommendations our committee provided, but I will provide highlights of four of them. One, construct with ins the instructional plan to minimize the need for a change in instructional format mid-semester. Two, continue to support instructors and programs offering in-person learning experiences that are essential 
to course or program learning objectives and or necessary for accreditation, et cetera. Three, continue to support student participation in on-campus research experiences. And four, continue to allow units to manage their mix of instruction education modalities, i.e. including experiential learning in accord with public health guidance. Finally, and in conclusion, one of the things that our committee found is choice is the coin of the realm. Minimize constraints and restrictions where possible. Offering as many options as possible will give the best opportunities to meet student, faculty, and staff needs. Strive to inform, educate all community members on public health matters so they can make informed choices such as the community health and safety standards are maintained. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, Provost Collins. Um, thank you very much, President Schlissel. Um, as noted, I will focus on the instructional portions of our plan. And in, in that context, our top priorities remain the safety of our faculty, staff, and students, as well as our commitment to delivering the best quality academic programs that we can for our students, given the context. Um, you know, of course, there are no easy choices here, so many uh, important considerations to balance, and reasonable people will weigh those considerations differently. They'll have had different experiences and reach different conclusions. However, I think it's very important for us to focus on our shared goals and work together to support our students, our faculty, and our staff in the months ahead. So as already noted, our plans were crafted from an extensive review of our experiences on campus and input from students, faculty, and staff. And, and you've just heard a summary of the surveys. Um, I'll also mention that we received numerous direct communications and petitions from faculty groups, from graduate students, undergraduates, and parents, as well as uh, conducted a number of meetings and conversations. And our decisions are also, of course, informed by the public health data, which we continue to monitor closely. So in that context, I'd like to reiterate that we are not making changes in our approach to instruction or residential density on campus for our graduate and professional students because of what the data indicate in terms of the experiences there. In terms of our academic mission, the picture is somewhat more complicated. Uh, as noted, classes have been safe and the changes we made to minimize risk have worked well. There have been very limited evidence of virus transmission. But as noted, the instructional experience has been challenging and stressful for many. And so we have uh, made a number of changes for the next semester, and I'd like to highlight some of those. So focusing first on instructors, many instructors continue to ask for assurances that no one will be required to teach in person who chooses not to. And we've made this explicit in our winter 21 plan. We also learned what we learned highlights differences among our schools and colleges. In-person instruction is seen as essential and working well in some programs while raising significant concerns in others. So our winter 21 plan is not a one size fits all, but will result uh, in variation across programs. Many faculty emphasize the difficulties of hybrid instruction where some students are in-person and others remote. And so we expect that fewer faculty will choose this modality next semester. And so similar to where we have ended up this fall, our instructional portfolio will have more remote instruction overall than was anticipated at the beginning of the fall, especially for our undergraduates. However, we'll continue exploring ways to support all of our faculty to teach effectively regardless of the modality. We've gathered feedback about experiences for our students, faculty, and staff more generally related to academics as well as mental health and wellness. And this has been a difficult semester for many reasons. Many students commented on the intensity of a semester with no breaks. As a reminder, we, like many other universities, eliminated the fall break to discourage travel to and from campus over long weekends. But the consequences have been problematic. So we've added two break days to the winter 2021 schedule, one on Wednesday, February 24th, and the other Tuesday, March 23rd. And while there be no classes on those days, offering a break for our students and our faculty, we do look forward to working together to craft voluntary and safe opportunities and programs to engage our community on those days. Many students have described a heavier workload this fall. 
There seem to be a number of reasons for this, and we'll continue to engage with our instructors to ensure that efforts to keep students actively involved in remote classes especially do not result in more work and stress. In addition, as uh, has already been mentioned, one of our goals is to provide clarity and consistency for things that are under our control. And it's important in that context for students to know the mode of instruction before they finalize their schedules. So we're expecting faculty to select their instructional modality before students register and accept in unusual circumstances to continue using that modality throughout the semester. In recognition of the extraordinary efforts of our faculty and staff to advance our mission during the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm also very pleased to highlight announcements that were made earlier this week. The university awarded eligible instructors and staff three additional paid days off for the upcoming holiday breaks. And Michigan Medicine announced the following changes. First, res restoration of the retirement match beginning January 1st, which is six months earlier than anticipated. Uh, second, faculty and non bargain for staff at Michigan Medicine will receive $500 in December. And in addition, some pro uh, professional development discretionary expenditures have been restored as well. In the coming months, we will continue to work on ways to improve the experience and enhance wellness within our community. And that will involve exploring ways to increase safe in-person opportunities for our students as appropriate. So I'll end by thanking the members of our community for their continued engagement and hard work to get us to this point. Working together and supporting one another are the best ways for us to move forward during what is likely to be a challenging next semester. Thank you. Thanks very much, Susan. I'd like to point out that uh, all of the survey data that uh, Dean Gallimore spoke about is posted on the uh, Blueprint website, the, all our COVID-19 dashboards and uh, all that information about the semester is on that website. And the plans we're talking about today are specific to the Ann Arbor campus, just to be clear to everybody. Uh, I next call upon Vice President Harmon from Student Life. Thank you, President Chalisso, and, and thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Before I outline the key points for our winter 2021 housing, dining, and other student life related plans, I want to take a moment to thank all students, parents, family, faculty, and staff who provided frank and helpful feedback on their experiences during fall 20. Our decisions on how to move forward, as you have heard, weren't made lightly and we took all of that feedback into account. The pandemic has made it challenging to deliver on the college experience that we want for our UM students and the experience that they expect and deserve. We recognize though that the pandemic has resulted in a lot of sacrifice for everyone, students, faculty, staff, parents, and families. I look forward to when we can get back to a full normal rhythm in this long in the long run but for now here's our plan for keeping you safe as possible as we head into the next semester every undergraduate student as you have heard who is able we encourage you to remain at your permanent residence during winter 2021 and to reduce our density in the residence halls and throughout campus we really really encourage you to do so Graduate students may remain, as we have found, extremely limited spread in this population. We're releasing all undergraduate students from their housing contracts for winter semester with no charge or no penalty. Undergraduate students who want to remain must reapply to stay in housing for next semester. Applications for winter term housing for undergraduate Students will be considered based on a variety of factors and needs. We will have limited capacity with single occupancy, and we want to provide support for housing students who absolutely need it, including those students who call UM home and who must remain on campus for personal well being, health, and safety reasons. And this includes undergraduate and international students who cannot return home or students with financial, academic, or varied housing related challenges, as well as other extenuating circumstances. We will provide housing for our rest staff, which includes our RAs and diversity peer educators. All units for undergraduates will be single occupancy. Detailed information on the process for moving out, for reapplying for winter term, 
as well as the application itself will be sent to undergraduate students living in, res in residence halls very soon. I recognize, I recognize that these challenges will be unsettling for many students, parents, and family during what has been a very challenging semester. We will take great care and concern during this transition to provide support and assistance. I wanna speak about the rationale for reducing density. You've heard from Dean Bowman, but our approach follows the public health guidance with single, de single occupancy and de-densifying the halls, the factors you've already heard about in terms of the spread during the winter. And we recognize that there is evidence of spread in the fall amongst roommates. So public health experts have recommended that we reduce the density. This also will ease the burden on our quarantine and isolation housing and decreasing density actually gives us more options to potentially increase the number of spaces for quarantine and isolation. We have heard extensive, extensively from our RAs and res staff, as well as students, that we need to lower the student to RA, uh, uh, resident to RA ratio, and we'll be able to do that. And that will allow us to provide more attention and support for our residents. I wanna speak for a moment about enforcement of safety rules in terms of conduct. For those who remain on campus in the winter, it is important to emphasize that we will implement strict policy enforcement. While many of our students complied with our guidelines through the fall and have been practicing the Wolverine culture of care and others made choices that put themselves and the community at risk. This fall, housing processed over 1600 COVID-19 related violations Although there was a relatively low rate of reoccurrence, this is still troubling. In some cases, we had to terminate housing contracts for some students. Despite this intensified approach to accountability, the changing COVID-19 context requires an even firmer and more stringent enforcement uh, uh, and disciplinary measures beyond what we've already implemented. We all get how challenging this is. It's not lost on me as an educator and a student affairs professional, how problematic it is that we're all in this paradox. Having to penalize students for attempting to engage in social behavior that is normal to them and healthy for their developmental stage creates some real challenges. However, safety is our highest priority. We'll be incorporating, as you've heard, mandatory weekly testing for all undergraduate residents which we, which we believe will help us track and curb the spread of COVID, but it also instills a stronger expectation of shared responsibility for students who remain on campus. The effectiveness of this approach has already been demonstrated on other campuses, and we'll have testing capacity to do this in a de-densified uh, campus next semester. We'll be carefully enforcing mandatory testing and refusal to participate may result in contract termination or other disciplinary measures. Dining, our dining program will um, continue in winter semester as grab and go or meals to go. We've explored a limited dine-in experience, but we are gonna hold on that and not offer that during the winter semester. And if we do find an opportunity to offer that in a limited way, we'll explore it and, and discuss with the community. But that uh, everything will be grab and go. Select university unions will open with reduced hours. Recreation sports will be open with some, the same safety guidelines as when we open this fall. And that is a big important part of health and wellness. So in closing, I wanna reiterate these plans for winter 2021 are informed by our commitment to safety in this community. It is informed by the feedback received from all of you, our students, faculty, staff, families, balanced with the guidance of public health experts. The Division of Student Life is committed to adding and improving opportunities for students to connect with each other in a very safe way so they can learn and grow outside of the physical or virtual classroom and campus. While today we're focused on sharing specific logistics and key issues like housing and dining, we're also working hard on engagement, health and wellness, and other opportunities for winter 2021. Thank you. Thanks very much, Martino. 
Uh, next is Professor uh, Emily Martin to talk about our testing regimens. Thank you. So as mentioned earlier by, uh, by Vice President Harmon, the, um, the testing offerings are gonna expand and in some cases are gonna be coupled with required testing in certain groups. So um, first of all, for undergraduates, specifically undergraduates that are living in residence halls, um, we're gonna ask that all undergraduates are tested and have a negative test prior to moving in. What this does is help us to curb spread into the residence halls for, from people coming from other areas of the state and other areas of the country, especially given the rising rates of COVID around the country. Um, once they're here, we'll ask that undergraduates are tested weekly um, as part of a regular cadence, a regular schedule testing program for these students. And then at the end of the semester, just like we're doing now, we'll ask that all undergraduates in the residence halls have a negative test before we're turning back home to their, their permanent residence at the end of their time in the residence hall. For undergraduates who are living off campus, but might be coming to campus to use campus facilities, to attend classes, to work on campus, to participate in research opportunities. For these students, we'll also be asking that they um, participate in a weekly testing program during the time periods that they're interacting with campus. Um, and this will um, be required to start before any of the on-campus activities begin. Um, this is requirement is also going to be extended to graduate students that are living in residence halls, um, particularly graduate students that are newly arriving to residence halls, we're going to ask that they have a negative test prior to coming to live in the residence hall. So coming with kind of paired with the, um, the new testing requirements will also be expanded offerings testings for people that aren't covered by these requirements. So this will include um, undergraduates that aren't interacting with campus, but maybe living in the local area, graduate students, um, professional students. Um, well, the weekly testing will be available, but not required for these groups. We'll also have um, the availability of testing for faculty and staff doing in-person teaching and, um, and working on campus. There'll be weekly testing available for those groups as well. So these initiatives are coming along Side, um, a lot of other initiatives to expand and promote and provide easy and accessible testing throughout the community, both on campus and off campus. Um, this will include initiatives like expanding the convenience of quarantine testing, continuing surveillance testing for those not participating in weekly testing programs, and um, continuing to add more locations and hours and, and easy access for testing across the whole community, um, and continuing our efforts to partner with student groups to promote additional testing initiatives uh, throughout the campus. Uh, thanks very much, Emily. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Preeti Malani, our Chief Health Officer. Thank you, Mark. I just, uh, I, I'm not going to talk too much about where we are on campus. I'll just refer everyone to the maze and blueprint and things are better, but uh, we're still having cases. We're still having clusters. And as things get worse in the area, this is, this is going to be uh, something that in the next few weeks, uh, as we're wrapping up the in-person part of this semester, we really need to be vigilant. Uh, those of you who are in Ann Arbor, if you're looking outside, it's gorgeous this, uh, <laughs> this weekend. And we, we are concerned uh, about activity and um, the, the risk of spread that might occur this weekend. So please, extra vigilance. You know, I say it every time, you know, this is, this is where we are and uh, we, we all need to work together to protect the entire community. The life you save could be your own, it could be that of someone you love. Uh, I do wanna recognize how difficult this year has been, how disruptive it's been and acknowledge that the coming months are gonna remain challenging and as it gets colder in Michigan, it's gonna be harder to be outdoors. Uh, we, we need to, to stay focused on what we can do. And while we're focused on COVID, we also can't forget about overall well-being. And throughout the pandemic has meant hard choices and frankly, imperfect choices, unfair choices. This is, is disruptive. Uh, in, and fortunately, there's also not an easy end in sight. So we'll work together to manage risk and really make good decisions to protect everyone. Uh, while our community has shown incredible grit, resilience, kindness, uh, there's also a lot of downsides. We're, we're, we're seeing loneliness and anxiety, depression, stress. Uh, these issues have always been there, but they have gotten worse during the pandemic. And not just on our campus, but really throughout, throughout the world. 
Um, and it's with this in mind that there'll be some changes and uh, Provost Collins mentioned this, there will be two midweek single day well-being days scheduled during the winter. And uh, this will be February 24th and March 23rd, I'm told. This is a time to take a break to catch up and also take an opportunity to engage with the campus in, in a virtual format. Uh, many of our students, faculty and staff do use and benefit from our various counseling services. And I am pleased to announce that those will also be further expanded. And for the students, Wolverine Wellness is a great option as is the counseling and psychological services caps uh, for the rest of our uh, community. Uh, there are also specific resources with FASCO and the Office of Workplace Counseling and Resilience. And We'll make sure that all those links are available uh, in the chat and, and also afterward. Uh, CAPS will be adding additional counselors, eight additional counselors, counselors, I'm told. And all of these programs have virtual visits. And you know, for students and parents, especially, just I, I like to emphasize, you know, there are no wrong doors. Reach out if you need support, whether it's you know, to some one of your professors, whether it's to your RA if you live in, in housing. Uh, just reach out and we'll try to get you to the right door. Dean of Students Office is also a great resource. Uh, you heard a little bit the campus recreational sports facilities will continue to be available in the winter with reduced operations. Exercise is essential. Uh, you know, movement is something that we can do and we should do. And while the weather allows it to be outdoors as well. And I do want to make one big plug around flu shots. Um, many students have gotten these uh, as long as as well as faculty and staff, but it's not too late. And you know, for students, remember that this was included in your health fees, so there's no out-of-pocket costs. Uh, we'll, we'll share a link to the UHS website. You can sign up and, and go get a flu shot either at one of their uh, clinics or make an appointment. And this is gonna be especially important this year. So we're not dealing with two overlapping outbreaks and flu is something that we, we see every year, but with COVID added to it, it will, it, it will really uh, create some strain. So th thanks very much, Dr. Milani. So we've got left about uh, 10 or 15 minutes for some questions. Uh, Pretty, will you handle uh, parsing the questions for us? Yeah, uh, I will. You know, we don't have a lot of time, but this was a, this is a one question that came up and uh, this is for uh, Provost Collins. How will the winter term policy that only courses that must be taught in person will be delivered that way and determined by instructors and program leaders affect the F1 visa status of international students? Uh, we've been told that international students need to take at least one in-person class or they will risk losing their F1s? Uh, that's an important question. So I'm happy to give a little bit more information. So if the current guidance um, around immigration remains the same for the winter term, then it is only those students, those international students for whom winter 21 would be their first semester who would be required to take an in-person or hybrid class. And we would certainly work with those students around that requirement. Um, and the Department of Homeland Security has not announced uh, any new guidance for the winter, but this is being monitored very closely by our uh, international center. And so certainly if there are changes, we would make sure that they are uh, well understood and well known and to continue supporting our international students. Thank you. And there, there's a follow-up question, which is when will we know the format of classes? So, um, we are expecting our instructors to uh, working with their units to make clear the modalities of our classes before registration, which is uh, occurring later this month. Great, thank you. This, um, I'm gonna uh, present this question to uh, Dean Bowman and uh, Dr. Martin. Um, and I know we've talked about this issue, but it's, it's good to revisit this. Um, are there data to suggest that there's been significant transmission from the undergrads to the greater university community, graduate students, faculty, uh, instructors, or the Ann Arbor community? Sure, I'll take a stab at it and then let my colleague Emily Martin add to it. So we do, the university does work very closely with the Washtenaw County Health Department uh, to uh, monitor not only activity for the University of Michigan campus, but, but more broadly in the county. And I, I presented data on um, what's happening in the state of Michigan. The same is true at a county level. We're continuing to see increases. And so for the, uni for the University of Michigan students who um, have tested positive, that contributes uh, to the county numbers, uh, but there hasn't been evidence of crossover 
if you will, uh, that, that independent of increases in upticks among university students, there seems to be an independent uh, uptick uh, in, the, in the county more broadly. And then uh, the, the campus community outside, so you know, staff, graduate students and faculty, uh, there, st there still continues to be very little evidence of, of transmission there. And we, the, my colleagues talked about uh, instruction and, and things like that. Those activities have, have proceeded largely in a safe manner throughout the fall semester. The only thing I'd add to that is something looking forward. Um, and I think the one, one thing we want to remember, we did see kind of what we call a demographic shift. So a lot of younger people being infected in the fall across the country. Um, as we move into this era where there, we see rising rates in all age groups, um, and we're kind of going into something more similar to earlier in the year where we have all age groups being infected. We want to remember, um, everybody in our community needs to remember what happens as we go from here out into, out into our families, into the rest of the community around that we're making sure we're traveling safely and that um, we're, you know, for residence hall students, make sure you get that negative test before you leave. We'll be following up with resources to do that, that we're, we're bit, doing the best public health preventative measures we can as we leave the university community and go out over the next couple of weeks. Thank you. I want to shift a bit and just uh, touch on a question that was brought up too is what are the plans to engage students socially yet safely? And of course this is going to be even different in the winter and how will we help students who are feeling isolated during the winter months and how's the university assisting first year students in building connections? I might start with uh, Martino but I'd love also for Alec to, to uh, weigh in on that you know, from an academic standpoint. Sure, Dr. Milani. You know, one of the things that we learned from this fall as we were trying to uh, approach everything with a, an abundance of caution and safety, which we'll still do, but we, we may have missed some creative options, particularly while the weather was warm to, to really just do some sort of informal things outside and small groups. Um, we also have county orders on gathering limits that we were trying to abide by, but we, we really have started planning actually before the stay in place order on how we can take some creative approaches and those plans will carry over into the um, winter term. And just an example um, for winter term, we will open the, the community and multicultural lounge, lounges on a reservation uh, based uh, opening. And that will allow for some opportunities with mask on socially distanced uh, opportunities for engagement. So that's just one example, um, but we know the, we the weather will be frigid, but if we do get a break in the weather every now and then, we need to use those uh, days creatively to do some things different. And I'll just be very brief um, as well. I mean, one thing I'd like to add to that is the importance of our student organizations and competition teams. And so we've been engaging um, with those either uh, virtually or actually in person with uh, the usual uh, measures for safety that's needed. So things like the solar car team, um, the um, human powered submarine team, et cetera. You know, engineering is very much a hands-on endeavor. And so we, there's no competition for that. And that actually is an important element in terms of uh, building and maintaining community among our students. And then finally, I'll, I'll reiterate, um, making sure that we engage our undergraduates in research as well. It's really important that they have an opportunity to say, stretch their, uh, their legs, if you will, and also their minds uh, as we uh, navigate through very difficult times. And so we're providing an opportunity not only for them to engage socially, but actually to engage in, um, in a way of enhancing their, uh, their academics as well. Those are great comments. And just from just my you know, anecdotal experience, the students who have found sort of homes, whether it's with the student organization or another activity, I think they've really been able to build some great uh, connections. So we encourage everyone, parents who, families who are listening in, you know, this is a, this is a good thing to also encourage your students to do. Uh, one question, and this is for Martino, if, if we've already left campus and live in a residence hall, how do we get our belongings back? You know, certainly, you know, and, and as I mentioned again, there, there will be detailed information from housing coming out very, very, very shortly. But if you've left campus already and you need to retrieve your belongings, there's an opportunity to make arrangements to come and get the belongings between you know, now and November 20th. And then uh, you know, we'll have a break during Thanksgiving, but certainly after that, the week of November 30th, um, throughout the 
remaining portion of the semester, you can do that. And if you are unable to, or if that's very difficult, housing will provide information about a packing and shipping service where you can have your belongings shipped um, to you. And that was something that we um, did in March when the pandemic first hit. So, and then I just wanna remind students as well, the contract flexibility applies to winter um, term. So, um, you know, just make sure you talk to housing in terms of your status for this semester. Thanks, and uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to the president with a question and then let him have the last couple words here. How would a vaccine to COVID-19 impact the decisions made around uh, the winter semester? Yeah, I think a, an approved effective vaccine um, ready, you know, late this year, early next year, I think would infuse us with a sense of optimism and greater confidence that we'll be able to get back to normal uh, in a medium time horizon. Uh, but it will not impact the winter semester. You know, you think about the challenge of distributing a new vaccine to hundreds of millions of people, uh, and the government will determine, at least initially, the priorities of who gets the vaccine to begin with. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done after we have a good vaccine. Uh, but personally, I think it would be a wonderful cause for optimism if one or two vaccine candidates were approved and the process of administering it begins, because I think that would be a, um, give us clarity on what the pathway looks like to get back towards a closer to normal version of a Michigan experience, but it won't uh, be in place by the winter time. It won't affect the winter semester. Uh, so um, as I wrap up, um, I just uh, wanna acknowledge and recognize the fact uh, that um, the winter plan uh, is, is not one that, uh, is gonna result in a, a normal circumstance. Uh, there are many people uh, whose plans and aspirations will be interrupted by the winter uh, plan. Uh, I feel very badly for students who don't get to have the uh, full Michigan residential experience, uh, but I've been through the dorms enough this fall semester. Uh, it's a very unusual semester. It's not the full Michigan residential experience that's going on right now. It's very challenging. I remember being touched by talking to an RA uh, who told me that he couldn't recognize his students. He only sees them occasionally and only when they're wearing masks. Uh, I've heard from uh, parents about uh, their students not really having much contact with other students in the hallway, the kind of socializing experiences we all remember and value so much from residential higher education. Uh, so it's just a very difficult time. It's not anyone's fault, it's the virus's fault, as, as I've said before. And our job is to help our students uh, progress academically to the completion of their degrees with the highest quality of education possible, uh, to help our, our faculty continue their teaching and research and to maintain both safety and a sense of safety, and then to keep the institution strong so that when the pandemic passes, we can come out of it as the leading public research university that we uh, entered the pandemic as. Uh, and it's gonna require everybody pulling together around a shared set of values and goals. Uh, we'll continue to modify things as good ideas happen and as, as information of the, the virus changes, we'll continue to try our best to be flexible, but we're confident that the plan we presented uh, strikes a balance that'll see us uh, through the winter semester uh, with as much good health and as uh, much good education uh, as we possibly can. Uh, so thanks all very much. The plans are all available in written form up on the website. All the supporting documents are up there as well. All the data you heard about today is up there on the website now. Uh, and uh, stay healthy, everybody. Uh, we'll do another briefing again next week. And go blue. Thank you all very much.